Now we're going to look at measures of spread, and one of the main ones are standard deviation. But first, let's start with the range. Remember, the range is the distance between the minimum and maximum data points, and it is a single number. It is not the two endpoints of the data set. So you might say, oh, it went from 2 to 20. That's the range. The range would actually be 18. So it's one method to measure variability, but it is not resistant to outliers. So if I have a really high point, then it's going to pull it up automatically. So another measure of variability that is more resistant to outliers is standard deviation. And we're going to go ahead and calculate that by hand. But normally, you're going to use a calculator or an applet or a spreadsheet to do this. But I want you to see where it comes from. So consider the following data set. We have negative 4, negative 2, 3, 4, and 6. What does the mean? Add them up, divide by 4. Add to 5. There are 5 data points. And you get 1.4. So how far is each point from the mean? How far is negative 4? How far is negative 2, et cetera? Well, we call this the deviation. So the deviation is your data point minus the mean. So negative 4 minus 1.4 is negative 5.4. And we would have negative 3.4 for negative 2. We would have 1.6 for the value of 3, uh, 2.6, and 6. So what happens when you add up all the standard deviations? They add up to zero. Well, is this always the case? Now, uh, this is a really cool applet that's on GeoGebra that's going to let me explore a more powerful way to measure spread than IQR. So first of all, um, these are some data points that I have here. And we've taken the average, or the mean, and that's 1.4. And the cool thing is, if I move the data point, you can see how this is dragging the mean lower as I pull it further away from the group. right? So um, basically, if I want to look at the spread of the data, one thing I could do is look at all these numbers here. Now, this would be, this is, E is 4.6 above the mean, D is 2.6, C is 1.6 above the mean. Uh, a and B are both below the means, and you can see this should show a negative, but the software is a little picky, and it's showing the negative here. So these are below the means. So these are called the deviations, which is the distance from the point to the mean. I can't really use the total deviation because that's zero. And zero is not going to tell me a lot, a lot about the spread. If I move the point, it's still zero. Even if I bring these over this way, it never changes from zero. So I don't want to use that point. I don't want to use just the deviation. So how can I make this not add up to zero? I could square them. So we could square the deviations to get rid of the negatives. So we're going to put x minus x bar squared here. Negative 5.4 squared would be 29.16. Negative 3.4 squared is 11.56. 1.6 squared is 2.56, and so forth. So here are all our squared deviations. And when we add them up, we get 71.20. Now, how can we compare variance? That number that I just showed you is the sum of the squared deviations, all right? And it's sort of a predecessor to variance. So how do we compare variance, or the spread, for different size data sets? We're going to have to divide by the sample size. So that's going to give us the variance. So we're going to divide it by n minus 1 instead of n. And that has to do with when we take samples versus population, all right? Um, what do we do with the variance in order to get it back into our unit? So once we divided it, we have the variance. Um, we take the square root, and that will give us the standard deviation. Um, what does this remind you of, kind of squaring, adding, taking the square root? It might remind you of the Pythagorean theorem. So let's go ahead and uh, finish working on it here. We're going to look at it in this example. We have the deviations. Um, here are the measurements of the level of phosphate in the blood of a patient in milligrams per deciliter of blood made on six consecutive visits. Determine the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean, uh, we have to add these all up and divide by 6. So we get 5.4. And then I'm going to go 5.6 minus 5.4 is 0.2. Then 5.2 minus 5.4 is negative 0.2, et cetera.
And if I did it correctly, they should all add up to zero. Now we're going to go ahead and square the deviations and add them up, and I get 2.06. To calculate the variance, I'm going to divide this by 1 minus the sample size, or the sample size minus 1, really. And I get the variance, which is 0.412. And to get the standard deviation, we take the square root of that number, point, um, and I'd actually get 0.642. So we have variance for sample is s squared. A standard deviation for sample is s. So variance for sample is denoted by s squared. And here's the formula. You take the difference, you take the, all the deviations, square them, add them up, that's what that symbol means, and divide by n minus 1. So here are the squared deviations. Add them up right here, see? and then divide by n minus 1. In this case, it was 6 minus 1. For a population, we actually have a slightly different formula, and we use a slightly different symbol. It's called sigma. And um, with, we also have this summation symbol there. And we do x minus the mu. That's mu is for the population parameter. So we have x bar is for sample, mu is for a population. And instead of dividing by n minus 1, if we have the whole population, we just divide by n. All right. Now, by the way, the good news is most of that calculation will be done on your technology or calculator. So I also wanted to take a look at weighted averages because that's going to come into play in some of our frequency table work. So um, these are frequently used to, to determine overall grades. So in, in stats, you have different weights on tests quizzes, and daily work, all right? Um, it can also be used to determine averages for frequency tables when we use the frequencies as the weights representing their proportion in the distribution. So to determine a weighted average, you multiply each value by its weight, or if you're using a table of frequency, sum the products from the previous steps and divide the total of the weight by the total of the weights, all right? So uh, AP stats, we got 50% tests, 35% quizzes, 15% daily work, and actually we're 40 and 10 now, but we'll still use these old numbers. Simon has the following scores in each category, 87 for tests, 80 for quizzes, and 95 for daily work. What is his current average? So I can take that 50% and I can either use it as 50 or 0 0.5, 0 0.50, multiply it by his test average, plus 35% times his uh, quiz average plus 15% times his um, daily work average. Then divide by the sum of the weights. These add up to 1, and we would get 85.75. So that's how you do a weighted average. <clears throat> now, the reason I get into weights is we are going to do frequency tables, which is very similar. Now, in an engineering summer program, the midterm has a weight of 2, daily work has a weight of 1, and the final has a weight of 1. Alana has a midterm grade of 94 and a daily work grade of 100. What is her average before taking the final? So we know that the weight on the, uh, the midterm has a weight of 2, the daily work has a weight of 1, and that's all we have, so we don't have the final yet. And we go 2 times 94. 1 times 100 divided by 2 plus 1. So at this point in time, Alana has a average of 96 before she takes the final. Now, uh, here's a frequency table. So we're going to go ahead and actually do a standard deviation for a frequency table. And the reason I was doing weighted averages just now is because Frequencies are a lot like weights, so we're going to first need to do an average with frequencies. So in preparing for the Math Club pizza party, the officers poll the members to determine how many slices of pizza they would like to have. And we're going to use the results to determine the mean number of slices a student will eat, as well as the sample standard deviation. So um, we had four students say one slice, eight said two, 12 said three, 6 said 4, and 3 said 5. Now I've already got an example worked out here for you, plus the numbers that just go there so you don't have to copy them all down. So the first thing is, how many people did I poll? Well, I polled these four students, those 8, those 12, those 6, and those 3. So I polled 33 students. T 
to figure out the weights, I'm going to take the frequent or the average, I'm going to take the frequency times whatever value it is. So I'm going to have 4 here, 16 here, 12 times 3 here gives me 36. Add these all up and I get 95. That is, we're not going to say that the average number of slices per student is 95. I have to divide, this is the total number of slices of pizza I'll have, need. Because I have four students that want one, eight that want two, so they want 16. Twelve that want three, they want 36. Uh, six want four, three want five. So between all my students, I have, they want 95 slices of pizza. How many are there? There are 33 students. So the average is 95 divided by 33, or 2.88. Then I go back in, just like we were doing before, and subtract um, from the data point 1 minus my average or my mean. And then after I get these, by the way, I don't need to add them up here. You can kind of extrude that. I'm going to square them. You better have all positive numbers in this column, because uh, when we square, we always get positive. When I've seen students make errors, it's because they're squaring this negative 1.88 and they're somehow getting negative 3.53. Squared numbers are always positive. The last step, so I'm going to have this deviation, uh, squared deviation of 3.53 for each of these four students. So I could actually, one way I could have worked out this table is list one four times and had four rows for one. Then have eight rows for two. 12 rows for 3, and I would have this listed 4 times. I would have this listed 8 times. I would have this listed 12 times. But to make our life easier instead of doing that, what we do is we take the frequency. I said, oh, I would have had 12 rows of that. Well, to add up those pieces, I can just go 12 times the 0.015, and I get this. Here, I have 4 rows of 1, so I'm going to have 4 of these. And here I have 8 of 2, so I'm going to have 8 of these. 8 times 0.77 is roughly that. And then I finally add them all up. Now remember, we have to divide by n minus 1. If we're dealing with a sample, which usually we are, then we're going to take this number divided by 32, and we get 1.30. Take the square root, and we get 1.14. Now. Again, you're not going to have to calculate standard deviation normally, but you should be prepared to show the steps on how to do the calculation. You might even need to write out a formula where you're showing the x minus x bar squared, adding them up, and dividing by here. So frequency tables, when dealing with classes of values, so we have intervals, we actually can also do um, averages and statistics and standard deviation for that by using the midpoints of the intervals. So I have this table here, and this was, I'll show you, the um, a random sampling of players at a Pokemon Go community day, and their ages were recorded. All right, And the way I'm writing the interval here is from 10 to less than 20. I'm just kind of writing it, including 10, up to almost 20. All right, you might remember that notation from Algebra 2. So um, if I'm doing 10 to 20, my next interval is 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60. I don't quite reach 60. And I have 24 people in this interval, 12 in this one, 5 here, 9 there, and a bunch of retired folk, maybe 14 in this interval. So I can't go 24 times 10 or 24 times 20, so I'm just going to use the midpoint of the interval. Instead of 10 or 20, we're going to use 15. Instead of 20 and 30, we'll use uh, 25, and 35, and 45, and 55. Now my total frequency, the total number of people I surveyed was, was 64, all right? And I'll still need to do a mean. So I'm going to do this 12 times 25, right? 5 times 35, and then add these all up. To find the mean age, I'm going to take this product, just like we did before, and divide it by 64. I get the average age of the people was 31.4. Okay, then we can calculate the deviations by subtracting each 
midpoint, we're using this for x. Um, so we'll subtract this mean from each midpoint. 25 minus 31.4 is negative 6.4. 35 minus 31.4 is 3.59. 45 minus 31.4 is 13.59. Then we square these values and multiply them by how many of them we have. So we have 24 of these and we have 12 of these and then we have a 5 of these. This gives me these squared deviations and then my final sum of the squared deviations. To take the variance, we take this number and divide by n minus 1. So instead of dividing by 64 like we do for the mean, that could be a little confusing, we're going to divide by 63. Okay, so our variance is 261.5 and our standard deviation is 16.2. Um, by the way, to find the median on a histogram, and you might need to do that, total all the frequencies and divide by 2 to figure out where the middle point will be. Count through the frequencies till you get halfway through, coming from other, either side. So uh, halfway is about 0 0.32, 33. And both of these um, are going to be in the second interval. So we'll say that our median is roughly 25, somewhere between 20 and 30.